So it's no exaggeration to say that we could spend an entire semester talking about representations. In fact, if you go to graduate school and you study more abstract algebra, there's a lot of representation theory in the subject because it turns out that thinking about linear transformations is often a much more convenient way to think about group elements. But we're pretty much going to leave it at that. And you'll see what the purpose of talking about representations was in a moment, because we're going to use the standard representation of the symmetric group to get at what is the definition of the alternating group on n symbols. But first, we're going to take a look at what is the motivation behind all of this. The motivation for the alternating group is to think about whether or not a, an element in the symmetric group, whether or not a permutation, preserves orientation or reverses orientation. Where does this language come from? It's kind of suggestive language. Well, it might come from thinking about symmetries again. Let's think about the dihedral group of the square. In D4, our symmetries really had two different flavors. We had the orientation preserving flavor. This consisted of the rotations, er, r squared, and r cubed. And then we had the orientation reversing transformations, t, tr, tr squared, and tr cubed. So the symmetries had these two different flavors, a preserving and a reversing flavor. In fact, these correspond exactly to the two elements of the quotient group, d4 quotiented out by the rotations. We saw a couple of videos ago that that was isomorphic to z mod 2. So these were the two flavors of symmetries. Does this idea have some kind of an analog in the symmetric group Sn? So can we associate to elements of Sn, permutations on n symbols, can we associate a notion of orientation preserving or orientation reversing to them? So let's think about what that would take for a minute. We need a way of distinguishing between those permutations that somehow contain a reflection in them and those that do not. So thinking about Sn now. In Sn, the role of these reflections are going to be played by the elements that are transpositions. Why are transpositions similar to reflections? They're similar because they're just elements of order 2. For instance, if I swap the first and second entries, and then I swap the first and second entries again, I get back to where I started. So every transposition in Sn is an element of order 2. So these are going to play the role of the reflections. So here's a fact about the symmetric group on n symbols. We're not going to prove it right now, but this is a very handy fact. The fact is that any permutation can be written as a product of transpositions. In other words, if we understand the transpositions, the elements of order 2 in the symmetric group, then somehow we understand all of the elements of the symmetric group. So here's an example. If I have the permutation 1, 4, 3, 2 in S4, how can I write this as a product of transpositions? Well, what it amounts to is it amounts to playing this little word game uh, that everyone has probably seen in a logic book once, uh, once in a while. What we want to do is we want to get from 1, 2, 3, 4 down to 4, 1, 2, 3. That's the action of our element 1, 4, 3, 2 on 1, 2, 3, 4. We want to get from the top to the bottom by applying a series of transpositions. So here's one way that we could do that. Let's suppose I first swap the third and the fourth entries, that I get 1, 2, 4, 3. And that adds a 3, 4 to my decomposition of this element. Then let's swap the middle entries. I end up with 1, 4, 2, 3. And I get a 2, 3 as an element in my decomposition. Then if I swap the first two entries, I end up at 4, 1, 2, 3, which is where I wanted to end up. So just by playing this little game, we find out that 1, 4, 3, 2 can be written as that product of three transpositions. 3, 4, followed by 2, 3, followed by 1, 2, reading it from right to left. Now here's another fact about this fact that's even harder to prove, really. That fact is that the number of transpositions that it takes to represent a given element of Sn is uniquely defined by that element. In other words, no matter how I play that word game that gets me from 1, 2, 3, 4 down to where I'm going, however I decompose an element like 1, 4, 3, 2, it will always be comprised of the same number of transpositions. So because we found a transposition series that was three transpositions long, any other composition of 1, 4, 3, 2 into transpositions will have three transpositions in it. So if we're thinking about how to see a notion of reflection or orientation preservation or reversing in Sn, Here's an idea. The idea might be to sift out how many transpositions make up a given element and whether that number is even or odd. For instance, if I had an even number of reflections in a linear transformation, then that transformation will preserve orientation because the reflections will cancel each other out somehow. Meanwhile, if I have an odd number of reflections, then that linear transformation would reverse orientation. So we're going to kind of separate out the elements of the symmetric group according to whether they have an even number of transpositions in them or an odd number of transpositions in them. One of my favorite stories is of uh, the physicist Paul Dirac. 
who at one point, uh, well, I guess the rumor was that Dirac used to sleep through invited lectures all the time when he was in the audience. And he was attending a lecture by the physicist uh, Yoshio Nishina at one point. And Nishina was doing a complicated derivation, came out with an answer, but the answer had an extra minus sign compared to what he was expecting. And so he remarks to the crowd that, oh, I must have had a sign error someplace. And Dirac kind of wakes up from his nap in the back row and corrects Nishina to say, well, you must have had a sign error in an odd number of places, and then presumably went back to sleep. The point of that anecdote being that having an odd number of sign errors is really gives you the same result at the end as having a single sign error. And having an even number of sign errors would actually give you the same result as having no sign errors. So the, the moral of the story is, if you're going to make sign errors in your calculations, make sure you make them an even number of times so that it all cancels out. So what's the moral of that story? The moral is that we can make a definition on what is the sign of a permutation. This sign is going to be a number that we assign to each permutation that tells us whether that permutation is comprised of an even number of transpositions or an odd number of transpositions. And the way we're going to get at that number is using the standard matrix representation of each element in Sn. So that gives us actually a nice computational way of determining the sign of a permutation. The even permutations, those that are made up of an even number of transpositions, will assign the sign of plus 1. And the odd transpositions will give a sign of negative 1. So how does this work? Well, because we know that we can decompose every element of Sn into transpositions, each of those transpositions, when we look at its standard matrix representation, is going to be obtained by taking an identity matrix, and by an identity matrix, and swapping a single pair of rows. So every row is going to remain the same, except for the two that we happen to be transposing. What's the determinant of that matrix? Well, that is an elementary matrix in the theory of row operations in linear algebra. And it's an elementary matrix that always has a determinant of negative 1. So one of the properties of the determinant is its anti-symmetry, that if I swap two rows of a matrix, its determinant is going to change sign. So the identity matrix with two rows swapped will have a sign of negative 1 in its determinant. So what this means is that if I have a transposition decomposition of a, of a permutation sigma, so if I write sigma as a product of, of transpositions, then the sign of sigma is going to be the determinant of the matrix that I get by multiplying the matrices of all of my transpositions together. But because the determinant is a multiplicative function, the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants. So what I get here is the determinant of each of these transposition matrices multiplied together. But as we just said, each of those transpositions, because it's a single row swap of the identity matrix, has a determinant of negative 1. So at the end of the day, the sign of this permutation is negative 1 raised to the power n, where n is the number of transpositions that make up sigma. And as we know, negative 1 to the n is going to be positive when n is even, and negative 1 when n is odd. Note also that the set plus 1 minus 1 forms a group under multiplication. It's a group that's isomorphic to the additive group z mod 2. So in that sense, S, this function that assigns a sign to each permutation is more than just a function. It's actually a homomorphism from Sn into this group that has two elements. So then we can now define what the alternating group is. The alternating group on n symbols is going to consist of all the permutations in Sn that are even. In other words, all of those that have a sign of plus 1. These are all permutations that are comprised of an even number of transpositions. So as an example, what does A4 look like? So we have some elements from S4, which belong to A4, and some that don't. Well, A4, of course, because it has to consist of elements of even numbers of transpositions, will consist of zero transpositions, just the identity element, and those elements that are made up out of two transpositions. That's going to consist of all of the three cycles, as well as what I call the 2 plus 2 cycles. And there turns out to be 11 of those in total. So A4 has those 12 elements, made up of zero transpositions and made up of two transpositions. Meanwhile, anything that's made up of one transposition, so all the single transpositions, and anything that's made up of three transpositions, none of those will belong to A4. So there are 12 elements over here that don't belong to A4. In fact, they belong to the complement of A4 in S4, which we can also think of as a coset of the subgroup A4 inside of S4. The last thing we want to do is look quickly at properties of cycle lengths, both in the symmetric group and in the alternating group. The first of these two facts is something we looked at before. That if I take a, a, a transposition, sorry, not a transposition, a permutation sigma, and I multiply on one side of it by an element g, and on another side by the inverse of that element, I do what's called conjugate sigma by g. 
then sigma and its conjugation will always have the same cycle type. Why is this true? Well, the reason it's true is that when I conjugate, when I multiply by a group element on one side and its inverse on the other side, all I'm really doing is I'm rearranging the symbols that I'm permuting and then rearranging them back. So at the end of the day, I've really done the same thing just to a renaming of the symbols that I'm permuting. So as an example, if I have the element 1, 2, 3, 4 in the symmetric group S4, and I have the group element 2, 3, then what does its conjugation look like, the conjugation of sigma by G? Well, that means that first, reading from right to left, I'm going to apply G, followed by sigma, followed by G inverse, which in this case happens to be the same as G. And so at the end of the day, G inverse sigma G gives me this permutation, 4, 3, 1, 2, which we can rewrite as 1, 2, 4, 3, if we feel like. And the important point is that we started with a 4 cycle, and its conjugate was also a 4 cycle. So conjugation in the symmetric group doesn't change the cycle type of an element. The second interesting fact that we haven't looked at yet is that any two cycles in Sn that have the same cycle type are conjugate to one another. In other words, if sigma and tau have the same cycle type, then I can find an element g in the symmetric group such that tau is equal to the conjugation of sigma by g. Here's an example. Sigma and tau here have cycle type 2 plus 2. Let's see if we can find a group element g in the symmetric group such that tau is equal to g inverse sigma g. To do that, I'm going to play this word game again. Okay. I want to get from 1, 2, 3, 4 down to 4, 3, 2, 1, the action of tau on 1, 2, 3, 4. And I want to do that in the middle with sigma. So sigma transposes the first and second and then third and fourth entries. And then on either side of sigma, I have to have g and its inverse. Now keep in mind what the fact was that, that allows us to prove these two facts. And that is that when we conjugate by elements in Sn, we're really just renaming the objects that we're transposing. What's the difference between sigma and tau? Really, the only difference between sigma and tau is that in one of them I have a 2, and the other one I have a 4. So the difference between sigma and tau is really just a difference where I swap the elements 2 and 4. So here's a guess. What if I try conjugating sigma by the element which swaps 2 and 4? Does that give me tau? Let's check it. First, we'll apply 2, 4 to this. So we get 1, 4, 3, 2. Then we'll apply sigma, which transposes the first and second and the third and fourth entries. Then we'll apply g inverse, which is also 2, 4. And sure enough, we end up with tau at the end of the day. So tau is indeed equal to g inverse sigma g, where g is equal to 2, 4. So this works in the symmetric group. Any two elements of the same cycle type are conjugate by an element in Sn. Does this work in the alternating group? Leading question of the day. It turns out the first fact certainly does, because every element in the alternating group is also an element in the symmetric group. If I take elements in the alternating group and I conjugate them, I'm not going to change their cycle type, because that's true in the alternating group, because it's true in the symmetric group. The second fact, on the other hand, is a little more problematic. It may not actually be true. For instance, here we had an element in, uh, in an, sigma, and another element in an, tau. They had the same cycle type. Are they conjugate via an element of the alternating group? In this example, they weren't. Or at least the example, the example g that we found was not a, an element of the alternating group. g24 was a two-cycle, right? an element of not the alternating group. It's an odd permutation. So in this example, it took an odd permutation to conjugate sigma into tau. So when, it, when will it be the case that we can conjugate an element of the alternating group, an even permutation, into another even permutation of the same cycle type using an even permutation to do the conjugation? That's a big question, and that's actually a question whose answer is going to unlock a lot of the mystery of what goes on in our course. So at this point, what do we know? We know what the alternating group is. It's the group of all even permutations, in other words, permutations made up of an even number of transpositions inside of the symmetric group. And we got there by, first of all, looking at how to think about the representations of a group as ways of assigning square matrices to every element of the group in a way that the matrices multiply the same way the group elements multiply. That allowed us to define the sign of a permutation by using the standard representation of Sn. As we go forward, it's going to be the properties of this alternating group that are going to unlock the big theorem of our semester about the solvability of equations and radicals.